Hi, I'm Richard Stengel. I'm the author of Information Wars, How We Lost the Global Battle Against Disinformation. In fact, that subtitle is a little bit of an exaggeration because I don't think we've lost it completely yet. And I'm not even sure you can win or lose it, but we'll get to that in a minute. So it's a book about the time I spent as Under Secretary of State for Public Diplomacy and Public Affairs in the Obama administration. And uh, that's a long title. And what it means is that it, you, you do public diplomacy, but you do marketing, you do public relations, you do public affairs, which is the spokespeople. And I went into the administration after seven years as the editor of Time Magazine. I was a journalist for most of my life. Uh, I was editor of Time for a number of years and I went into government. I'd never been in government before. I always wanted to serve. Uh, I felt that journalism is also a public service and then I would go into actual public service. And in fact, it was a, it was a big surprise. The uh, bureaucracy was relentless. But the biggest surprise of all, and this is what the book is about, is how I came to see the rise of disinformation uh, around the world and, and tried to do something about it. I went into office in, in early 2014, and two things happened within a few weeks of my being in office. One was the beheading of James Foley, the American journalist by ISIS uh, in, in Syria. Uh, and the other was the illegal annexation of Crimea in Ukraine by Russia after all of the demonstrations in Maidan uh, against uh, autocratic rule and Russian domination. And these two things happened. They were, of course, in some ways unrelated to each other. But what they had in common was that the perpetrators uh, were both kind of masters of disinformation. And ISIS uh, was incredibly innovative in the use of social media, much more so than Al Qaeda had been. And the Russians, by the way, uh, who had been in the business of disinformation for decades, certainly through the Cold War, had also innovated and created something called the Internet Research Agency in St. Petersburg, which, which is a troll farm where young Russians went in and created uh, uh, adopted personas and, uh, and, and created all kinds of disinformation, which I'll get to in a second. The, uh, the countering ISIS, um, uh, which was about half of, of what came to be my job, um, was in some ways easier than countering Russian disinformation. Obviously, terrorist information or terrorist propaganda is something which the uh, platforms uh, don't allow for the most part, and particularly the kind of grisly videos of beheadings. But there was another side of it too. Um, I remember once looking at a, a tweet uh, from, a, from an ISIS member and it showed a basket of apples and the legend was, the caliphate is bountiful. That's not a violation of any uh, rule that I know of. And what became difficult was the fact that uh, ISIS, more so than the kind of grisly propaganda about beheadings, most of the content they created was about the idea of the caliphate and what it means to be a Muslim and all of these things that are actually um, perfectly proper and acceptable on any platform. Um, and in a way that was difficult to combat because you couldn't combat it all, nor should you, I don't think. The, the, the rise in Russian disinformation was, was something new to me. Um, even though I'd been in journalism all my life, even though I'd been editor of Time, I, I hadn't really seen the, the kind of ecosystem of, of Russian disinformation. In fact, I, it sort of came to my attention one day when someone walked into my office and I ha had a beautiful office and I had a big widescreen television in there and I think it was on CNN. And the person said to me, well, you should be watching Russia today. So I said, why? And he said, because they're making fun of you every day. I had been outspoken like President Obama, like my boss, Secretary Kerry, about what, what Russia had done in Ukraine and continued its soft invasion in Eastern Ukraine. 
And Russia Today, which was a little bit like Fox News in the US, had uh, used me as a kind of punching bag uh, to talk about uh, you know, how absurd the uh, American reservations were um, about what Russia was doing. I'd also noticed at the same time uh, that anything that I did on social media, and, I, and part of my job was to encourage people at the State Department to get on social media, which they were reluctant to do. So I was on Twitter and I began to, ha anytime I tweeted, however uh, mild or banal it was about, about Ukraine, I would get hundreds and hundreds of, of tweets uh, attacking me and calling me a fascist or a socialist or an anti-Semite using the same kind of content that they had done around the, the demonstrations in Ukraine. And this was also new to me as well. And it was around this time that we discovered um, the Internet Research Agency in St. Petersburg, which, as I mentioned earlier, was a troll factory. It was kind of an, an innovation um, uh, for, for what Russia was doing. Um, I think people have a misconception of, of Russian disinformation in the sense that it, they feel that it must be centralized or come from directly from Vladimir Putin. Um, it's actually not centralized. It's it's a distributed network. It's disaggregated, and and this uh, crony of Putin's had helped fund this troll factory. And the troll factory originally was uh, directed towards Ukraine itself, towards the Russian periphery, which we sometimes call the near abroad, to get Russia's story out about what was happening uh, in Ukraine, because throughout Russian history. Uh, and Russia's history with Ukraine is a thousand years old. Um, Russia has always wanted Ukraine to to lean eastward uh, toward Russia, whereas the West, certainly since the Cold War, uh, we want Ukraine to to lean more towards towards the West, towards the European Union, and towards freedom, towards democracies, towards. Uh, free speech and, and individual rights. And this tug of war has always had uh, Ukraine in the middle. Um, Ukraine is a country the size of France in, in Europe. There's it's probably lost more people per square mile than any place on earth between uh, World War I and World War II and the period in between and, and Stalinism. And it's really suffered. And it's a place that I became very close to when, when I was, was in office and, and visited it a number of times. But to get back to the Internet Research Agency, what these folks discovered, and I'm going to compress the story, is that, um, is that not only was the terrain around Ukraine ripe for disinformation, but when the American election began in 2016 uh, with uh, Donald Trump in the, from the Republican Party and Hillary Clinton from the Democratic Party running against each other, they found that the American audience was very susceptible to that same kind of disinformation and propaganda. Um, and the you know the the irony, of course, is that the Russians weren't particularly adept at it as we started looking at it. I mean, these these were young Russians who really didn't speak English very well, and they were given scripts, and they things they tweeted and put on social media were filled with grammatical errors and spelling errors, but apparently that didn't matter to the uh, American audience who wanted to hear uh, content that uh, likened Hillary Clinton to the devil and, and Donald Trump to, to a savior. And uh, throughout the election, there was disinformation that, uh, that was created by the Internet Research Agency. What, what they did on a daily basis was that uh, they created personas. They pretended to be a, a young woman in Chattanooga, Tennessee, or a black man in, in Detroit, Michigan. And uh, when it came to African-American audiences in particular, uh, that part of a long tradition uh, of Russian disinformation around uh, uh, civil rights in the United States, but they would tweet and put, and put up posts to black voters telling them, hey, uh, you know, you don't have to vote because, uh, you know, Hillary Clinton has already won or you can vote by mail even when uh, when they weren't allowed to. There was all this kind of um, deliberate deception that was going on. And 
I can't say, and I don't know, even though lots of people have opined on on how much it affected uh, the election. Um, I, I don't think it changed uh, the vote. Uh, very few people uh, in history go from being a, a Hillary Clinton voter to a Donald Trump voter or vice versa. Um, but it did fuel this kind of United States of, of disinformation and distrust uh, for media and social media. And, and this rise in disinformation has more to do with, with ease of accessibility. Um, because of social media, there's no barrier to people becoming content creators themselves. I mean, all you have to do is register for one of these services, whether it's Facebook or Twitter or uh, YouTube or uh, Snapchat or any one of these proliferating social media platforms. Once upon a time, you know, the, you had no outlet. You would send an article into a newspaper and hope it would be accepted. Now, anybody can create a blog. Anyone can create a persona. And I, I'm not so sure there's a rise in disinformation itself, but certainly there's a rise in the ease with which people can purvey it uh, and receive it and respond to it. And the solution to it is is not easy. I mean, one of the things I say in my book is that disinformation has been around as long as information. I mean, and I think we all know that throughout history, there have been conspiracy theories and, and wild theories about things that are promulgated by people who don't always have the best intentions. Um, the, the, the solution is a difficult one because I actually don't believe that governments have a, have a, have a very big role to play. Certainly in the United States, which has the First Amendment, which protects free speech, doesn't allow government to modulate or moderate speech in any way. It's really the, the, the big platform companies that are the gatekeepers. Those platforms themselves have become the public square. Uh, government shouldn't meddle in the public square, but they can. And one of the things that I talk about in my book, and this may be a little esoteric to this audience, is the legislation that allows the proliferation of these social media platforms was something called the, the Communications Decency Act. And there's something in it called Section 230, which says that these platform companies have no liability for the content on them, that they're not, in fact, publishers like I was when I ran Time Magazine. That means you can't sue them for something that's wrong. You can't sue them for defamation. You can't sue them for something that insults you. You can't prosecute them for, for putting up hate speech. Well, I actually think the legislation should be changed and other countries are changing it for their sphere, the UK uh, and Germany in particular. And the idea is to give them more liability for the content that they publish because they really are publishers after all. They're the biggest publishers in the history of the world. And to me, that would be one way of, of cleaning up the ecosystem because I, I know people like, you know, uh, um, criticizing the social media companies and talking about how algorithms are evil. I, I don't believe algorithms are evil. Algorithms give you more of what you're interested in. If you're interested in conspiracy theories, they'll give you more of that. If you're interested in Latin grammar, they'll give you more of that. In some ways that they're, neut they're neutral. But if you make those companies more, more liable for what they publish, they won't publish uh, this kind of disinformation. Um, in part because they know they can get sued by by governments, by by individuals. That's just one way to clean up the system. And the other point I make in in, in the book is that we don't have a, a so-called fake news problem, a, a phrase I loathe. Uh, we have a media literacy problem. People need to understand the provenance of information, where it comes from, and how to uh, distinguish between between fact and fiction, between something that has no plausibility to something which is created by journalists, working journalists who 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 uh, uh, who interview many people, who proofread what they do, and lawyers who look at it, it's it's uh, it's something that we all have to learn. It's something that should be taught in school from an early age. So that those are not the the easiest solutions, but there's the direction that we should be headed. One of the things I say in the book is that we should abandon all the, the language putting countering disinformation in terms of warfare, battles, or fighting. But of course, we use it all the time. Um, because the point is, is it has been around forever. Um, uh, 
gossip, uh, what people exchange. The difference is, is that it's now easy to for everybody to see. I mean, uh, uh, you know, once upon a time it was something you told your neighbor over the fence, and now you can tweet something out, and you know, hundred million people can see it in an hour. Um, so the the I don't think it's the role of governments to to police disinformation. Um, uh, I think that will make people only distrust the system even more. And autocratic governments are doing that now in places where people don't have freedom. I think a lot of it is both the responsibility of individuals, as I mentioned, that uh, uh, practice good information hygiene, figure out what's factual and what's not. Um, don't forward things that uh, that you think are not reliable. Um, but then at the same time, I think these the platforms have have liability. Uh, right now, the platforms kind of throw up their arms and say, well, we're not publishers. We're just publishing user-generated content. We don't edit that or moderate that. Well, they don't do that because they're not liable. They need to be made more liable. And certain countries in the EU, uh, I mentioned England and Germany, uh, are making them more liable. And um, and I would also, even as a consumer, you know, tell the companies or the platforms that you're on that you don't want to receive something, or you don't want to hear about something. That also will work. But it's a combination of new regulation, the platform companies and users that will that will, I hope, make disinformation more scarce. My wife used to say to me, "Why, why are you doing this?" Um, some of it was just, you know, I'd been a journalist all my life and going into government was a fascinating experience. It was like an anthropological experience. And I wanted to tell people about that. And and particularly when you had someone like Donald Trump, an outsider coming in saying he was going to remake government. One of the things I realized as a new person in government is that, boy, the only people who can change government are people who understand it. When you come in from the outside, it's very hard uh, to change it. The other thing was just as a journalist, seeing this, what seemed like a new phenomenon, the rise in disinformation, the, the use of social media platforms to, to try to deceive people on a mass scale, that struck me as a, as a big problem and it is a big problem. And I wanted to tell people about that. So I thought I could do it uh, through telling my own story uh, and trying to cope with this rise in disinformation. And I hope, I hope people uh, enjoy the book and learn from it. I'd love to get your questions uh, about any and all of this or or any of the work I've ever done. Uh, I'm so glad to be with you. You can send your questions into the uh, Hey Festival and I look forward to answering them. Thank you so much.